We'll call the meeting in order. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, at this time we'll have our open forum. Is there anyone that would like to come forward and address the board at this time? Okay. All right. I'm Ellen Kerr. I'm the organization lead for the Blue Zones Project, Albert Lee. And um, I'd like to talk to you today about tobacco, vaping, all the things that are going on in the schools. In Freeborn County, our adult smoking rate continues to decline. But the teen rate of tobacco and using tobacco and nicotine products has risen very dramatically. And this is across the country. It's not just an issue that Albert Lee or Freeborn County has. The Surgeon General has released an advisory saying that the teen use of tobacco and vaping devices that deliver nicotine has reached epidemic proportions. Our young people are being targeted as the best avenue to ensure that big tobacco can maintain and increase their bottom line because 95% of smokers begin before they're the age of 21. <coughs> Philip Morris just spent $12 billion to purchase a minority stake in Juul, a high-profile company that sells nicotine vaping products, a company that once said they were not part of big tobacco. Someone changed their mind. Every pack of cigarettes sold by Philip Morris has this attached to it. And it says, a federal court has ordered Philip Morris to make this statement about the health effects of smoking. Smoking kills 1,200 Americans every day. More people die every year from smoking than from murder, AIDS, suicide, drugs, car crashes, and alcohol combined. That's what we're dealing with. I'm, I am not an expert on tobacco policy, but I know what right looks like, and this is not it. In an effort to protect our young people from becoming addicted to nicotine at such an early age, and in response to this national epidemic of teen use over 430 communities and municipalities across America, including six states, have already passed retail ordinances to increase the age to purchase tobacco, e-cigarettes, and vaping devices to 21. In Minnesota, the number is 23, the latest being Waseca, Beltrami County, and Duluth. This national initiative is called Tobacco 21. On February 11th, the Albert Lee City Council had a first reading for Tobacco 21. Wanting to leave time for community input, the public hearing and, vote, and possible vote, they don't always vote on the public hearing, will be March 25th. In the interim, they want to hear from the public. If you as an individual or your organizations support Tobacco 21, it is very important that you let that support be known to the city council, to your friends, to your acquaintances. The council will base their vote on, the on what the community believes is the appropriate response to the health epidemic facing our young people. The tobacco industry is very clear about what they want the future to look like and the path they are going to take to get there. I believe that we also need to be very clear about what we want the future to look like and what we are willing to do to get there. Tobacco 21 is not a complete fix to this tremendous health risk. It's only a piece of it. And this danger that is facing our youth, this, this could be a good start. I encourage you to learn the facts about the teenage use of tobacco and nicotine products 
and in the end, support, support Tobacco 21. I would like to thank you for your time. I brought someone with me. Her name is Liz Heimer, and she is an expert on tobacco policy. She'll give you just a few details, and then if you have any question, you could ask her. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for letting me be here to speak on this. As Ellen said, I am an expert in tobacco policy. I've worked with many rural communities in Minnesota to pass Tobacco 21, such as Waseca, St. Peter, and North Mankato, and currently Mankato. And as Ellen mentioned, we are in an epidemic with a very dangerous and a very addictive product. This is one of the most addictive products known to man and it's easily getting into the hands of our teenagers and in our high schools. Now, we have a problem. We have a pretty well-known problem now, and we have an effective solution. So much so that many organizations, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Minnesota Department of Health, the American Veterans, all publicly support Tobacco 21 policies because of the overwhelming evidence. And so what that might look like for the city of Albert Lee and for your students here is a 25% reduction in youth tobacco use. In some places such as Needham, Massachusetts, who passed this over 10 years ago, they saw a 50% reduction in youth tobacco use, whereas their suburbs around them did not see the same decrease. And so I encourage you today to really look into this policy, continue that learning. We know that education is only one piece of this puzzle. It's a very good piece, a very important piece, but the real change comes with policy change. And we have an effective solution right in front of us, which is why hundreds of communities have been passing this across the nation. And so if you have any questions, I would love to answer them for you. Um, this is not an easy policy by any means. There's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns behind it, and I would love to address any questions that you might have now or at a future time. Thank you. Listening to the uh City Council's timeline, I think it would be appropriate if we did this at the study session uh, in March here. Yeah, that'll give us time to get the facts and also gather public information. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hi, my name is Krista Anneman. I am currently a sixth grade language arts teacher at Southwest Middle School. I'm here tonight to request the board consider adding staff development days for our teachers throughout the school year. Currently we have two at the beginning of the school year and then one right around Christmas break. And we ask our students to learn, practice, assess, reflect, practice and reassess on the standards we're expecting them to know before they move on to the next grade. And I think we as teachers should offer ourselves that same courtesy to learn, to practice, to reflect, to maybe adjust, and then uh, teach some more. Um, having full days to learn, discuss, and reflect will give us time with our colleagues to collaborate and learn from with each other without having to rush off to the next thing so that we have more time to dig deep into what it is, our standards that we want our students to know, and how best practice we can meet those standards for our students. Um, this gives us a chance to know what we want our students to learn, and also to know that they have met those standards. Thank you for considering this. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else who would like to come forward at this time? Hello, I'm Julie Eaton, and I'm a parent. I'm also a teacher, an instructional coach, teacher leader, responsible for helping to oversee staff development via our QCOMP program here in Albert Lee, and now I'm coordinator of teaching and learning. 
So I have three points that I'd like you to consider um, when making your decision tonight regarding the number of professional development days um, in next year's calendar. And I'm speaking on my behalf as well as the instructional coaches behalf in the district. Um, so first we're asking for an increase in days from what we've had the past two years so that grade alike and subject area alike teachers have the opportunity to hear the same message and receive the same training. Right now our reality is that pockets of staff development is happening based on teacher availability. This is creating a discrepancy in the fidelity of our work with students. It's also creating a strain on our instructional coaches who are trying to support all teachers. If different teachers are hearing interesting instructional ideas from their colleagues, they are intrigued, which is good, but then instructional coaches spend a lot of time repeating messages to teachers individually or in small groups. And we'd like to be able to share the big professional development ideas concisely in one large group setting and space these days throughout the year to allow time for teachers to implement, reflect, collaborate, make adjustments to their instruction and increase their fidelity. This ties to my second point. Professional development is an ongoing process. It is overwhelming at the beginning of the year, especially for our new teachers. We all need time together to process what we've learned and how implementation is going at multiple points in the year. We also want to retain our teachers. We often hear questions about teacher support in our mentor-mentee program during teacher interviews and it would be really beneficial for us to be able to say that we have adequate time for professional development built into our school calendar. And finally, educational research has repeatedly linked collaborative cultures with school improvement. So I'll close with this quote from the book Learning by Doing. We have heard individuals oppose providing educators with time to collaborate. They typically frame their objection by arguing the time a teacher spends collaborating with colleagues is time that could have been spent teaching students and thus represents unproductive time. Once again, research from both organizational development and education refute that position. Effective organizations and effective schools build time for reflection and dialogue into every process. The goal is not merely to do more of what we have always done, regardless of its effectiveness, but to create a culture of continuous improvement to discover ways to become better at achieving our purpose. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Julie. My name is Tree Snetzer, uh, and I'm an English teacher and instructional coach at Elberly High School. I was fortunate to have Neil Score as my English teacher for Senior Humanities, and he's the reason I wanted to become an English teacher. So you can imagine my excitement when I was hired by Albert Lee Area Schools to teach in Neil's old room and get to keep all of his old stuff, and the kids love looking at his records, <laughs> and eventually get to teach the class that made me want to be a teacher. In Neil's class, I learned about Socrates and how he was sentenced to death by the state for blasphemy and corruption of the youth. As Socrates was waiting in his jail cell for poison to be delivered, he was surrounded by all of his students who begged him to try to escape. He quelled their fears by embracing death, explaining death would be one of two things. Do you want to say it or do you want me to? <laughs> it would be maybe an endless night, which would just mean restful sleep, or it could be a chance to get to meet, converse with, and learn from all of his heroes. Socrates knew that while we can inspire our students and draw wisdom out of them, we have to get out of the cave and be inspired ourselves. We have to have the chance to talk about big ideas, to learn, to reflect, to grow. And I might be making a big leap here, and I'm sure there are many flaws and counter arguments to this comparison, and I would love to talk about the complexity with anyone who wants to, but Socrates believed professional development was important. A teacher needs the chance to get out of the cave once in a while and see the light in order to come back into the cave and be effective. As instructional coaches, I can say we are constantly working and planning and reflecting to facilitate the most meaningful professional development possible, as we know that enlightened teachers can positively impact students. 
For us, it's all about impacting teaching to impact students, and the kind of professional development we are aiming to deliver is what makes this happen. Thank you. Sure. Is it Martin Luther? Because I still don't know where that one is. Okay. 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 I'll try. Sure. Thank you. Uh, that's the whole background. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Quisley. I'm your math um, instructional coach or math specialist, depending on how you want to phrase it and the duties as assigned. Um, again, I would like to also echo my colleagues, um, Krista, Tr Julie, and Therese, and support of more professional development within the year. Many of us, if you've been in Albert Lee or you've been in the Midwest, you know who Richard DeFore or um, Robert Marzano are. What you may not be aware of is they wrote a book together. And I'd like to read you a quote um, from this book um, that talks about, it's called Leaders of Learning, How District School and Classroom Leaders Improve Student Achievement. And this is found on page 15, and if you ever want to borrow my book, feel free. Everybody borrows my books. Um, so maybe I have your book. <laughs> Neil, I don't know. Um, it's about school improvement. When you, when you talk about school improvement, you are talking about people improvement. That is the only way to improve schools, unless you mean by painting the buildings and fixing the floors. But that is not the school. It is the shell. The, pe the school is the people. So when we talk about excellence or improvement or progress, we are really talking about the people who make up the building. The people that make up our buildings are our teachers and our students. They're everyone involved that comes through the door every day. When we look at what we're providing our colleagues, we're the seekers of more professional development. I'm not saying I'm just the giver of the professional development. When I'm working with my colleagues sitting here to my left, I'm learning just as much as she from her as I hope she might be learning from me. We are constantly seeking that. Getting a one and done at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year is not enough. My colleagues, like I said, who have already spoke, did it very eloquently. What I want to leave you with is when we say we want to invest in our students, we need to start and keep doing that by investing in our teachers. Invest in us. Give us what we need and what we're asking for of more time sprinkled throughout the year because that's what the research sh shows that works. It's called meaningful distributed practice. It's practice that's meaningful distributed over time. That's what makes the big bucks work for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Diane Schultz. I'm building principal at Sibley Elementary. And if you take a look at our mission statement, one of the last, the last two words in there are lifelong learners. And we often think about that as our students, but that lifelong means all of us. I'm a lifelong learner. I've been in education for 30 years, and I'm continually needing to learn because best practices are changing. We need the staff development for our teachers in order for them to be lifelong learners. One of the things that I often hear from parents is, you know, I have three sections of this grade level or four sections of this grade level. Doesn't matter what, chi what teacher that child gets, we need them to get the same thing in each of those classrooms. And if we have teachers that aren't able to collaborate and have time together, it's very hard to ensure that. So we need our staff development days in order to make sure that all of our teachers are doing what they can to do the best for our students. I think at our last board meeting, you had the joy of having a phonics lesson presented to you, right? It's all new to us, and we, in order for our teachers 
to, do, to uh, promote, to get that, that education, that phonics program to all of our students. We need the development, professional development, in order for them to deliver that effective instruction. And we need to do that during the, those professional development times. If we don't have that, it's very hard for our teachers to go in and, make, and ensure that they're de developing and making sure that they can deliver instruction that's effective to our students. So not only does our mission statement say lifelong learners for students, we need that for our staff as well. Thank you. You all know me, I'm Mark Rosclose, high school principal. Um, we're gonna keep this short and sweet. Um, if we bring in a new teacher, which I get the privilege it seems like every year, we spend five days with them up front then we bring the rest of our staff in for about four days, and then we say, go. We wouldn't do that with anything else that we work on, students, athletes, anything like that. So it's very important to have time during the year. If we implement something in the fall, right now, it's basically checking in with them, but we never bring the staff back together for a meaningful amount of time to go over things. And so every year I've been asked, how do we keep improving education? We've raised test scores, we've raised graduation rates. The one thing we haven't given back to is the teachers. They're not asking for less days, they're actually asking for more work so that they can improve their practice. So I hope that you can support uh, adding these days to the staff development calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to come forward for the open forum? Okay. Move on to our public hearing regarding the tax abatement for a new home construction program. Uh, this is, so this is a hearing for that program. Anyone that would like to make comments on that? Okay, we'll go on to the next item and that's celebrating our successes. Uh, a best so and back. coordinator for the Adult Learning Center and it's since everyone has been bringing up lifelong learning we're always looking at different ways to um, to teach our students and our the people who are in our community and one of the things our students came up with was a sewing class so Lona here is on my staff and she um, she actually taught the class so it worked out really good and Patricia is one of our students do you want to say anything about the class could you come forward to the microphone, please? I have a loud voice. My name is Patricia, and I tend to the sewing class, and I made this beautiful day. Um, I really enjoy this sewing program because I feel like it's allowed me to gain new useful skills that I can practice all throughout my life. I would like, like and benefit from this program expanding and continuing to teach people this skill. We use later and could serve as employer skills. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And so ABS, so and back, Vern and Lisa here, were generous enough they actually do, they brought in 10 sewing machines for us to use they had their staff come and set it up we were able to leave it in the whole two months 30 students actually came to our sewing classes and as patricia showed you they made this beautiful bag and then they also made pot holders yeah, yeah. so um yeah so we're just really really grateful to um a best one back i don't know if you guys want to say anything or <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's nothing quite so good fe feeling as making something yourself, accomplishing that, and what a beautiful bag. And I noticed you even did dust the big corners. So that <laughs> was really awesome. <laughs> but uh, it was an honor for us to be, to be involved. So we thank really appreciate So it. the school board, this is from the school board, but I get to keep So going. thank you, thank you. Thank you. So this is a way to show. <laughs> Uh, 
the boards thank you to ABES Sonvac. It's uh, we appreciate your participation in the program, and uh, as you can see, it's been very beneficial for many students. I just wanted to say that was what she said too is after the people were done and they had made their bags, they came out and they were so proud of themselves that they did that. And you know, and it was just, I mean, I almost started to cry. The students were just coming out and so thankful. So I just, it was really meaningful that they did that. So again, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the approval of tonight's agenda. Uh, what are the wishes of the board? Okay, is there a second the motion? Second. Okay, we have a motion second. All in favor of uh, tonight's agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Pull same sign. Motion carries. Moving on to the consent items. Uh, what are the wishes? Okay. Okay, we have a motion and second on the consent items. All those in favor of the consent items signify by saying aye. 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 Pull the same sign. Motion carries. Moving on to reports, uh, Dr. Funk. I just got some of this information about 4 o'clock this afternoon and put it in the slides, and I apologize uh, if you can't read it, uh, if it's too small, but there's a lot of good information that just came out. Uh, next slide. Oh, it looks okay. All right, so the governor came out with his budget this afternoon, and it looks as good as I've seen for education in a long, long time. Uh, well, let's see if the House and Senate agree with it. But basically, he'd like to see an increase of 3% for uh, fiscal year 2020, which is next school year, and an additional 2% in 2021. Uh, this is a significant increase for both years to the to the formula, as you can see there. The other thing that he's trying to do, or, or that the, his administration, is try to maintain the uh, cross subsidy at uh, the current level of $830 um, per ADM, so that we are not moving backwards um, really any more than we are. Um, he's got something in there for. Uh, um, jump start or early childhood that doesn't impact Albert Lee, so I left that off. And he wants to increase, decrease the school safety levy um, from the current amount of $9 per pupil to $54 by 2021. So uh, as I can tell you that this is probably the best I've seen um, in, in years for, uh, for education. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the House and the Senate uh, do with it with all the other parts of the budget. Also, just to note, uh, I was notified on these two bills last week. Uh, House File 314 is uh, allow, it, it's allowing school districts to start school before Labor Day with no waivers. Um, uh, there is an individual on it who's the primary author, Representative Peggy Bennett uh, from our area is the co-sponsor on that bill. Also, on the Senate side, Senator Nelson, who's up in Owatonna, um, our, our Rochester area is uh, the another southeastern Minnesota um, legislator is sponsoring it in the Senate. Um, there also is another bill on the Senate side that says, because Labor Day is going to be later in the next couple of years, that school districts can start early before Labor Day, but that's more limited. This would basically say school districts can start when they want to start. Um, also of note is uh, in a few years' time, we will be coming back to the uh, public for a referendum that will be expiring. There is a bill in both the House and the Senate to authorize school districts to renew levies or referendums by board action, ones that are expiring. So we would not have to go out to the board, to the voters, for a if it were going to be a straight renewal. Um, I, I, when I was up testifying a few weeks ago, I was informed that the last 80 renewals of expiring referendums have been approved. But so is that operating refer yes. referendums? Yes. Yep. So boards for the last 80 times have had to go to the voters and say, would you please give us the money that we're currently taxing you? And so it's a lot of energy to run a campaign. Um, this would allow, since the impact would be, um, since it's expiring, it would be a, a, a zero impact on the taxpayers. Um, this would allow board action to, to do it, and if people were upset with their local board, they could take it up with them. 
and, and it's just on a renewal. It's not on authorizing the board to, to do any increases like the city and the county can do. So I, I think that that's of considerable interest statewide. Dennis. Just a quick question on the, I saw the special ed funding. They put the 77 million in. Um, did they talk at all, any inkling from federal at all? Uh, governmental affairs, we met with uh, Hagedorn's assistant and I laid into them pretty, pretty good on it. I'm hoping they don't seem to understand it. Yeah, I, I don't know if you guys had a chance to review the uh, editorial from the Star Tribune I sent a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this from, from our two of our newest congressmen, one from the Duluth area, one from an uh, outer ring suburb. Um, one's a DFLer and one's a Republican, and they both said that this is totally uh, out of control that the feds are allowed to do this. So uh, at least from our from our people who represent us in Washington, D.C., I mean, they get it. Whether or not the, the larger legislative body out there is going to do anything with it, I don't know. And again, the, the 77 million, we don't know what that's going to look like for Albert Lee yet, um, but um, it, it is the state's attempt to help us um, with, with the federal problem. Because And again, if the feds were doing what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't have to be taking the $77 million. This could be, this could be going elsewhere within, uh, within the budget. So, um, so that's the, the thought on that. Yes. Yep. Is that the end of your report? Yep, and then, Laura, you'll have a run probably within a week or two based upon what the governor's budget looks like. And then what we'll see happen is we will have the state, uh, the House will come up with their budget, the Senate will come up with theirs, and as board meetings progress throughout the fall or the spring here, we'll be able to give you a, a better idea what things are going to look like. Do you want to push that microphone there, please? Okay, moving on to board reports. Uh, let's start with Kim. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity and the pleasure to be a science fair judge, so that was really a fun experience, and I also got to give everybody their medals. So they're doing it a little different. They, there was trophies and ribbons before, and now everybody gets a, a medal, and it depends on how they scored. So they, they all look the same from the, you know, the glance, and so I thought that was a great idea. And there were, I loved that there were a lot of National Honor Society students there helping, and the the, the student to adult volunteers were, were was great. I also attended the Toy Teacher of the Year Committee meeting. That's a great group. They're they're fun. Angie said they're fun, and and I just thought it was a great representation of our community, retired teachers, and then current teachers. So it was, it was I feel honored to be on that as well. And then um, I did attend a home wrestling match. That was the first section match. And then um, I, I was able to go to hockey day for the first time. And I was like, where have I, why well, haven't I never done that before? So um, that was exciting. And they both won that day. So I also attended a home wrestling match. Just one? <laughs> oh, a few. I, I'm also on a couple of of committees outside of this board. Uh, the Business Ed Committee for, uh, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, and they have an event coming up, or they're sponsoring events coming up, um, Employee Devel Development Funding Pipeline Program uh, Lunch and Learn. It's uh, February 27th, Wednesday, February 27th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. I have a brochure. Uh, pipeline, in, in case you aren't familiar with that program, uh, it's an innovative approach to address current and future workforce needs. The program works with employers to change the conversation from how do we find workers with skills we need to how do we give workers the skills we need. It's very consistent with our emphasis on on vocational uh, and career training in, in uh, Industry 241. Um, so, um, again, that's... Uh, February 27th, Wednesday, 11 o'clock. Uh, you, you need to let them know you're coming because it involves a lunch, no charge. Uh, and uh, also, I'm on the, the Education Foundation. We had a meeting uh, last week, 
we meet uh, every every uh, even month. Uh, I think the uh, second Wednesday of every even month, and uh, we have uh, gained three or four re- really good uh, Dennis's on that committee, uh, good members. Um, uh, they're extremely bright, and especially when it comes to financial matters, about which I know very little, <laughs> and so I'm glad they're on board. And the, that's the good news. The bad news is that Lila Oss is uh, resi- uh, retiring after 20 years or so uh, of involvement in this committee. So that's it. Thank you. I attended the Family Services Collaborative and the Freeborn County Partners in Prevention meetings. Uh, at both of them, they talked about vaping and some of the other issues that all school districts are experiencing. And um, they're trying to get education into the schools. They've been into some of the schools in our areas and are I believe are hoping to get into Albert Lee um, to educate staff and community. Uh, spoke about that Tobacco 21 program that we heard uh, a little bit earlier, and the the um, it's the just the important piece of that is that it's involving tobacco sales, so it would not impact legalities of who can smoke or where they can smoke, but only sales. So sales would only be to age 21 and older because um, evidence shows that the greatest provider for minors of smoking materials are from those ages 18 to 20. So it it takes that, it would remove that local piece out of the equation and has shown to have uh, decreased smoking rates. And and, um, we'll be hearing more um, in the community um, over time, but on Monday, this Monday, February 25th at noon, there'll be a community forum on the Tobacco 21, and it will be in the Freeborn County Commissioner's Boardroom in the courthouse. And then also um, at the Freeborn County Partners in Prevention meeting, <laughs> it happened to be a snow day, so we were lucky to have uh, Officer Herman, our, our staff resource officer, with us and some other individuals who do work with um, um, chemical abuse um, situations with students. And um, it's it seems very apparent from what they indicate that our new policies that we have in place for the chemical, the substance abuse, seem to be having a reverse effect. They seem, it seems that um, use is growing, and again, not just in this district, but in all districts. So I think that it's important to, if things are starting to go the wrong way, that we should take another look and see if we do want to change that. So I will be requesting that our substance abuse um, policy and our athletic abuse, athletic policy will come again to us. So um, hopefully through the policy committee and forward. Thank you. Did have the opportunity to um, attend several of our, our uh, athletic events, which is always interesting. It was fun at Southwest, and I uh, want to congratulate Paul on uh, that foresight, or Mark, or whoever decided to move to Southwest when we I went to the Northfield wrestling match. I thought it was a wonderful event there, and I hope it's something not just for wrestling, but for other things we can take advantage of when we have a a nice facility, and I know there's logistics that go to it. And I mean, things like a popcorn machine again. You know, I'm just kidding. But I mean, things like I thought it was a great thing. And I also, when I go to these events, I do take the opportunity to talk to several kids and parents about things like e-learning and our early start or post Labor Day start. So again, a nice opportunity there. Spoke to a couple classes at the high school and. Um, Interestingly enough, I, they know who I am, and I get an opportunity to ask them the same questions. So it's kind of fun conversing with the kids about that and getting some of their uh, feedback. So. All right. I also was a judge at the science fair. I did not have the opportunity to give uh, awards, but so I was lucky. But uh, that was a, it's a great experience, and, and I'll... Uh, I think the best part about it is all the student judges that are there. It's amazing. I mean, there's probably about three or two two students to every adult there volunteering. It's really amazing. They do a phenomenal job. It's fun working with your little group of students, the people who are in your group. Anyway, it's a great experience. Uh, 
And then uh, the, I have not been able, was not able to make the last Teacher of the Year meeting, so I'm glad that Kim was able to make it. The Teacher of the Year tea is tomorrow at 4 p.m. in the high school. Okay, <laughs> let me finish here, Dr. Funk. Is that is that an official declaration of a e-learning day right there? Can I go home and tell my son? <laughs> okay, so it is. If there's no snow day or early out, <laughs> it is scheduled for 4 p.m. in the high school commons tomorrow. If there is a snow day, which seems even more likely than I already thought of, <laughs> or an early out tomorrow, then it'll be on Thursday, uh, February 21st at 4 p.m., same location, high school commons. It's an awesome event. Um, it's so much fun. So if you can... It's tomorrow, which is 220... The, uh, 221, Thursday, Thursday this week. Or you could have an E-T. An E-T-O-Y. E-T-O-Y, that's right. Yeah, that doesn't sound like so much fun. Uh, and then, um, oh, I, I uh, went to the ALHS Has Talent. That was, like, super cool. Um, uh, very nice job by all of the teachers and staff members. And it was uh, for the, um, the proceeds went to the Ori Jurley uh, Scholarship Fund. So that was, like, that was, like, really fun. So kudos to all of them putting that together. It was a good time. Thanks. I as well attended the um, business education uh, chamber meeting. Uh, one of the things they're doing there, and I think it'll be good for the community, they're starting the eggs and issues again. I think we'll see three this spring. And that was the other thing that they had talked about. But really starting to talk more and more about the education people pieces with the students. And it's not necessarily just the four-year degree, but the technical training that we need to find and have available for the student. Uh, so that was a, a very good meeting. Uh, I missed the uh, Education Foundation, and I apologize for that. I had uh, family issues, so um, I was unable to be at that one. Uh, and I don't think we had any. Uh, the other one kind of tied to it, I uh, serve on uh, Vitality Center and uh, the uh, wellness, uh, worksite wellness, and one of the initiatives with the uh, tobacco issue. When it first came up, I, I got to admit I wasn't really warm on it, but that was before I had my youth and government session in the cities, and I was the hotel director for 1,600 kids. Uh, that opened my eyes. We sent probably 20 kids home that we caught. Uh, they think it's a funny thing, and it's not. Um, and my guess is they're getting it from 18-year-olds. Uh, so it's it's probably an urgent issue. You hate to have more and more legislation, but this is a case where, uh, for the protection of our students, I think it's a, a really important avenue we go down. Well, that's what I have. Thank you. Um, next we have our student board members, Maggie. Okay. Um, I don't really have a voice today. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess... I did want to go to that AOHS has talent, but I was in the cities for the day, but I heard very good things. Um, I was a judge at the science fair for the first time. and That was very fun. Thank you for doing that. Um, I guess Night to Shine was a couple weeks ago. That was very fun. Um, other than that, I guess, I don't know. Gigi? Um, yeah, those are great volunteer opportunities. Also, we talked about athletics. Winter sports are ending, so spring's coming in. We got captain's practice starting. Um, also, Knowledge Bowl is going to regionals on Friday, so wish us luck there. Um, and my trial is also the JV team, my past the varsity team, and they're going to regionals uh, this week, next week. So that was a little disheartening, but that's okay. <laughs> and yeah, that's about it. So, so teacher's the, report, Dara. So, so real quick, uh, before we pass Gigi here, uh, uh, it's my understanding you were all state choir this past weekend. Um, I did an all state honor band. Band, on okay. My flute. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations. Awesome job. I think I can talk loud enough for everybody 
need to hear, but is it on? Is it off? Okay. So I, my name's Dara Jerzvik, and I am an intervention teacher at Halverson. I've been in the district 18 years, so I feel privileged to be here tonight. I um, have a few things that you've already talked about. One is the science fair, and I just came from an exec council meeting for the ALEA and was told that was the record number of kids, 143 kids entered this year. So that's awesome. At Halverson, we had some trouble getting parents to help, so National Honor Society students, thank you very much for stepping up to Halverson, for helping Halverson students. And Southwest had a career fair last Friday, and each student had an opportunity to attend three sessions, so they made their choice of six different things, and I guess almost all kids got their top three choices honored, so that was a really big, big success. And at Halverson, I'm just going to focus on a couple of things that we've done in the last month. Burger Bingo, we had a great turnout for parents, even though we had to reschedule it from a snow day. And uh, we had Prairie Fire Children's Theater come, and we did Sleeping Beauty. And we had one boy and the rest girls. So we <laughs> it was an interesting um, performance, but it went really well. And we had, we had some trouble getting some older boys this year which is not something we've struggled with in the past, so that'll be something we're going to focus on, getting some boys involved. Uh, we're going to celebrate I Love to Read Month this Friday with a green eggs and ham breakfast with our Halverson families. And if you don't know what families are, every staff member in the building has a mixed-age group of students, and I have 12 mixed-age kids from kindergarten through fifth grade. And so we do... Um, Something specific every month, we usually read a book together and have a focused activity. So every teacher is doing the same activity. And this month, it'll be focusing on I Love Treat Month. So that's the news for me. So thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to curriculum instruction, uh, the school calendar. So per the board request from the last um, workshop, you have two calendars that were out um, in the um, board packet. Um, just to go back to the one that was uh, discussed last week, we made the adjustments per the board request um, commencement to the 22nd of May. Um, and um, the other request was to go from 173 to 174 days, and so that if you look at the October 21st date, which currently is gray as a PD day, would be, um, if, if that's the board's wishes, taken uh, out and become the 174th day and become a student day. So um, those were the two items from the last meeting. And then you also have, per request, the post-Labor Day start, which adjusted forward um, to uh, after Labor Day. N uh, pretty similar to the other, just adjusted. So I guess unless you have any questions for us. The 21st. That would be the, yep, per the boards. Well, the, the, I was asked that question by the staff, and as you, as you heard tonight from a number of teachers and administrators, their preference is 173 days. So the, the recommendation from your administration is 173 days. Now, it's, if the board chooses, they can certainly cross out the 21st, but the administration's recommendation coming forward is um, as you see presented here. This uh, may be a parliamentary item, but uh, we uh, acted a couple of years ago to have 174 student contact days 
And so unless the board, in my opinion at least, unless the board uh, t reverses that action and, and stipulates a lesser number of days, then uh, I don't see how we can approve a calendar that has less than 174. You approve a calendar every year. It, it's, up, it's the board's purview how many days of instruction they want within that calendar. As your superintendent, um, working with teachers and administrators in this district, um, you have heard their concerns about staff development. Therefore, for the 2020-21 school year, the administration's recommendation is 173 days. Now, you can move forward as a school board and go 174, absolutely, but the proposal that we have suggested to you right now, Neil, is 173 days. Do I have a light? I do have a light. Okay. Um, so um, I, I, I first of all want to thank the work that people have done on this and how, I mean, um, I've asked a lot of questions and I've gotten feedback right away and so I I can't tell you how important that is to me and how I think people need to know that that um, when when a question's asked we're, we're given feedback so um, I also wanted to get feedback from the people that it affects um, we heard from some some parents but I I talked to a lot of students and, and and tried to talk to some some teachers and I heard resoundly what I heard tonight that professional development has to be intentional and has to it can't just be okay we're going to sit and and learn something but then we have no opportunity to to implement it it's going to sit on the shelf and i've been a victim to that and it's it's no it's not a good feeling you know when i have a really good idea and i can't use it and so um i i feel like we already we talked about this last time we already are over what the state requires um i wasn't on the board when you decided on 174 but i feel like we're already are we five six days already over what the state requires student contact days for uh, that are required and so I feel like giving the, the teachers that 21st it I, I feel like that's a responsibility we have I also heard from students um, and I we, we I did hear from some teachers they wouldn't mind starting later but I, I resoundly heard from teachers and from from students that they really like finals being done um, before that Christmas break and they really like uh, the starting early and so um, while I, I understand that it, it affects people's family life and things I guess I'm just kind of going off on my feeling on this but uh, um, I, I feel like um, the due diligence that we were that I was you know charged with in my investigation <laughs> I feel like we're, we're given an opportunity to do what's right which for students and staff, and that's why I'm here. So I'm, that's my two cents and plus, right? Um, when you say we're adding three, Dennis, we're adding one. That October 21st day would okay. be a change from kind of th this year. The, the three in-service days that are circled at the, in August, those are for new teachers. Okay. Okay. Am, and then am I we not have that in October, and then is it January 2nd and 3rd? Are those in-service as well? Yes. Okay. Yes, sorry. We, we shifted one from August to one of those other days. Okay, that's... And, yep, so, that, so actually it's two is what we're... Or it's we're adding one and we shifted one. So that way we can look at... They have time to look at things after that first two months of the year, and then in, to start the new semester they've got two more training days to help. Right, and, and when we look at the second and third, I mean, some of that is just staff work time, such as preparing report cards, because the semester's over, now they're coming back in, they're getting report cards ready, um, and then professional development within teams, within buildings, et cetera. 
So is there a way to um, shift that day on October 21st into the second semester since we really only got two days in January, the second and third for professional development days? I, May 20, or I mean uh, May 22nd on that early start schedule is last day of school. I know that's finish up, pull it together type time. But as I look down there thinking as of what I heard from some of our teachers in that tonight about, you know, maybe the opportunity of spreading it out. And when we look at it on October 21st, and I mean, I know that we've got the 20th and the 17th and Martin Luther King Day and President's Day in that. And I know those are days off per se, but just trying to find a way to squeeze that extra day in, but mostly shift one more professional development day into the second half of the year. Right. And when we talked in the learning team, which is a teacher leader group uh, from each building and then uh, principals, the discussion was that, you know, we have pr professional development in the start of the year, and then that gives us nine weeks to practice, get it going, and then a professional development day to check in, what are we needing, what's working, what's not, readjust, reflect, and then start um, sc school again. So it was intentionally kind of planned out that that was just a good time to do it because of a nine-week period because there, you know, is professional development in the beginning of the year, checking in with new teachers. Um, so that's why the October date was picked. Not really, then we can't really call professional development on the 2nd, 3rd of January because we're not going to have a check-in day. Is that what you're basically saying? One of those two days will be. Oh, one, yes, for sure. One, one will be grades, getting ready for second semester. The other one will be a staff development day. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for the two calendars. I do appreciate that. Um, and then... Oh, from what I heard the last time we had a meeting, and then I think maybe I was bringing that with me when I was listening to everyone give feedback today, it sounded like, I know it was mentioned the last time in the comments that we got, or in an email or something we got, is that um, teachers would also like uh, like another staff development day in like the second half of the year. I mean, not like right at January, but like somewhere in there. And I know we discussed that a little bit. So I kind of would like to see that. Um, and, and then a couple of comments on maybe how that could be possible. Um, I mean, looking at their both calendars, and I don't know that this might not be possible. I, I, I know how things work at schools, and sometimes you, you need all those days at the beginning. But is it possible to shave another day off the beginning of the year for professional development, getting ready, and put that somewhere else on the calendar? And if we're looking at, um, then that would just only, if we're looking at the early start, that would just bring us to that Friday, the 22nd. So that wouldn't make a big difference in the school year, being the length of the school year. And if we're looking at the post Labor Day start, uh, we could take, you know, maybe come back that on the second, and then we'd have a day to wiggle around with, and maybe get a day off earlier or something. I know we were talked about just coming back on that third would be kind of weird on a Friday, but since we don't have anything going on in the post Labor Day calendar, we could on the second and the third, kids couldn't come to school. We could take a day somewhere else and put in a little professional development, and then uh, go one one day less, get off on Thursday. So those are a few of my comments so far. Mary Jo or Kathy, what are your thoughts on, on taking another day from the August time frame and moving it somewhere else? I think the discussion with teachers is it looks like a lot of professional development on the, if you look at the 12th, 13th, 14th, but they're not necessarily professional development days because when you look at everything that needs to be done and Dara speak up as a teacher student or a teacher up here, you know, we're setting up classrooms, we're preparing for conferences, we have all families coming in, um, we're teaming with teachers, we're teaming grade alike, we're also having to plan schedules for students who um, maybe are receiving services from special ed, EL, um, Title I access. There is a lot of work put into getting that first start to the day off. And so it's not PD, it may look like it's PD heavy in the beginning of the year, but there's a lot of other things going on, um, as well as August 10th will be the kickoff district wide where we'll have all uh, staff in in the morning. The Tuesday morning at the staff kickoff in all the buildings that principals really 
uh, get the vision aligned with their teachers and start the year off right for that building. And so when you talk professional development, there's not a lot of professional, de it's happening, but it's either in afternoons or maybe a couple hours here, um, other than the designated day on August 8th, there's really no days to shift because we can't take away also all the work that teachers need to put in before we actually get the year, school year started. You have any comments on that, Derek? Well, I guess just speaking from the position that I have this year as an interventionist, those conference days for elementary, we were testing kids as they came in for conferences, so to have a time in October to actually take a look at the data and where they've progressed in that eight or nine week period would be really helpful because now what we're looking at is testing in December and then we have quite a bit of time there and if students had, haven't made progress then what are we going to do differently if we can catch that earlier then maybe we can move more students toward the learning that we know they need to, to make the growth they need to make that's my only comments about it so in the past that that January like this this year you guys came back a day before the students was that like getting doing the grades getting ready you didn't have PD that day so adding that PD there would be a second semester add in elementary we don't get days to do grades you do that on your own time so our PD is PD together so we don't ha take a separate day in elementary. Yeah, that was, um, so that day before was split, getting ready, and then um, whatever the building, it wasn't a district PD day, so whatever was the building plans. So keeping that at the building level, what, what do they need? And so each building has its own staff development team, and so they um, determine what to mm -hmm. do on some of those opportunities. So. And I think, you know, like Dara said, we tested on the, what would be the 15th and 16th as you look at the August calendar on the pre-Labor Day start. So our elementary teachers really have to be ready to go <laughs> on the 14th. Um, th they, have, uh, they have full days of conferences with parents and they do testing. So if we say the 12th is the district day and all those you know, blood-borne pathogens and all those other fun things happen on a day like that, then really buildings have the 13th and 14th to do all those other things in addition to preparing their classrooms, so. Yeah, I, I could say we, we as a learning team and the bargaining units, I mean, we spent a lot of time discussing um, there's been a lot of effort put into this to what is what is best for kids and still trying to meet the needs of professional development for our staff because that continual growth and, and I think Pam Jacobson said it best here last week is is here's a veteran teacher and she's 30 years in and she said she needed that professional development um, fortunately um, you got to see phonics in action but we all need to grow and um, we all believe that as well couple of comments. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all of you uh, teachers and support staff who who appeared and uh, championed professional development. And, and it's not my intention to denigrate uh, professional development. Um, I can only say that as a, a classroom teacher for many years, I was very jealous of student contact days and this year would have been a, would be a, a, a horror show for me because of all the snow days and and even under ideal conditions when we didn't have a lot of missed days I was always desperately trying to catch up and uh, I, again student contact days are very dear to me uh, and uh, we, I know, I know, uh, Kim, you mentioned that uh, we're only required to have 165 student contact days. Well, thank goodness for e-learning days because we would be really hard pressed to satisfy that requirement this year. And uh, 
the worst, there, the, there's nothing good about making up days, uh, no matter when you schedule them. It's not the same as a regularly scheduled day. So the more, as far as I'm concerned, the more student contact days we can build into the calendar, uh, the better. I, I'm certainly not opposed to professional development, but I would very much prefer that they not be at the expense of student contact days. Uh, and, and then just w one other comment. I, I also remember uh, that those days at the beginning of the of the year, uh, before students arrived, uh, were oftentimes filled up with all sorts of activities that did not include the teacher getting ready for those students when they showed up on Monday morning. Um, uh, uh, days when you can just work in your room uh, uninterrupted, getting ready for students are, were also dear to me. So I'm, I'm not in favor of any calendar that provides for less than the number of student contact days we have now. Um, first, can you elaborate on, there was a comment earlier about um, to have PD for grade alike and subject alike. What's getting, what's hindering that now? Is there just not enough time, everybody's getting ready and not, or just not blocking it out or we need that extra day? You know, we have we can do the grade alike meetings in the beginning of the year. What comes into play is during the year, those aren't, they're just not built into the calendar. So that's why we're not doing them. And a, a good example would be last week, as we're all talking phonics, we had the phonics consultant here to do a check-in. Where are we at? She helped us go through our data and kind of plan the rest of the year. And so what we ended up doing is sub, we just hired subs and we had them go in different classrooms. All right, let's pull these teachers and we'll meet, we'll look at the data. She observed them teaching phonics. Where if we had a professional development day, we'd have that consultant with say a Halverson or a, all third grade teachers in the district here at Brookside working on what's going well in third grade phonics. What are, what are issues for next year? What do we need to address? And so we just don't have those days to do that. So that's an example of um, that continual professional development throughout the year. Thank you. And thank you for two calendars as well. I had a couple questions on the post Labor Day calendar. I was also wondering about January 2nd and 3rd. Is there a reason that those are not designated as PD or staff days as they are in the pre-Labor Day? And then also is January 20th, it looks like that is a district day on the post Labor Day. So I'd say the 20th is maybe an error. That should um, should be a no school day. Thank you. Um, um, and then um, Student day, it's a district day. It's the end of the semester. So that is why the, uh, um, that is why that, that is grayed out. So staff only on that date. And then the second and third, um, the reason that we're not doing staff development um, those two days is it's to give everybody the full two weeks at, at Christmas. And we, we could take a Friday per se and have teachers come back on the third for that day. Um, but uh, I think I would get probably significant pushback from uh, some folks in the district if we said to the teachers, you're coming back Friday to come back for one day and then um, everyone else is coming back on the 6th. So that, that was the rationale behind that. Thank you. And it just, I guess it's just not consistent between the two. So would it, would it be a possibility to have, because they're already coming on the pre-Labor Day, they do come in on the Thursday and Friday, and then they have the 20th off. Would that also be an option in the post to come in on the second and third and then have the 20th off for consistency, or is there a specific reason? The, the reason is the getting ready for the next semester on the 20th, so we're giving them time to work. If, if I were to make a recommendation, I would say 
we would do this two days of staff development on the 20th and 21st. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then I guess my only other thought overall, well, I do have one other question on the post. Um, because on the pre, um, the it looks like the first semester has 82 student days and the second 91, which I think we were anticipating that to be a little heavier second semester. But in the post, why are they still, why is the first semester still, it's 83 and the second semester 91? Could we not even those out a little bit or is there a reason for you, that? You could and the, the rationale is state testing. We have, we have a lot more testing going on second semester. Okay, thank you. And then um, the last comment I have right now is um, regarding snow days and e-learning. Um, I've been getting a lot of feedback from the community about e-learning and you know some love it and I think it's a great idea but there I think there are challenges as well uh, with consistency and all all of that but I think that m my feeling would be and especially if we're going to be jealous of those student days I would like to see built-in snow days on January 20th and February 17th um, that our students could actually have time back in their classroom on a regular weekly schedule there. It's not like adding a day on at the end or taking out a spring break. And then in addition to that, if we had any more after that to have the e-learning. And I don't know that I would go above five. And I see that we have five days here. So that I would prefer to have snow days built in January 20th and February 17th. The concern with February 17th is we have a number of bargaining units who have President's Day off. And so yes, the, we could have the teacher's report, but we would have, um, I think, no custodians, no secretaries. Um, so the 20th is a possibility. Just kind of following up on the e-learning day, um, in talking to some different people, one of the things I had heard was it was it's a, it's been an anomaly to have that many days off in a row. So for example, the take home bingo, that probably got old after the second time. If you have one snow day and then you have another one a month or so later, um, that will be good for the kids. But um, what I was hearing is that it has to be meaningful and in, in, in educational for the kids on that. I think we're working our way through that right now. So the the e-learning is a good piece for us, but as with anything, we just have to continue developing it. We do, and this winter has been, I think we had a pretty severe winter four or five years ago, but it's, those are the only two times in education that I can remember having this many days impacted by, uh, by instruction. And, um, you know, we are we are providing <laughs> opportunities um, for our students at this point in time, and I can tell you that we are reevaluating what we are doing with e-learning and how can we improve it and make it better. Uh, but I don't think anybody's wildest imagination that we when we had zero snow days before Christmas that we would have is where we're at right now. I'll so kind of echo what Dennis said about the e-learning that. It seems like a lot of some people like it and some people aren't a huge fan. And I do think, I think that it's already gotten better over time because I remember while well, my son was still at Halverson doing the bingo cards and I asked my, my nieces how they liked e-learning. And at first it was like way too hard, they thought. And then the teachers kind of had to like finagle it and figure, figure it out. And I think it has gotten better over time, but there's just, there, in it, hopefully we can get it even better. I think some people complained about the consistency. Some teachers are requiring a lot. Some are requiring not too much, which if it evens out for a student, that might not be so bad. Um, but I think as long as it keeps getting better, I think it's already gotten a lot better, and I think it will. Um, I think it's actually a, a good thing. Um, people I talk to most primarily do like it. There are some complaints, but. That may be an opportunity for staff development. Well, and just um, some other comments on the e-learning is, as we are probably in our fourth e-learning day, we sent an 
email to all the elementary teachers, all right, well, it's fresh in your mind. Give us some other ideas. What are you hearing from parents? What's the feedback? And let's put it in. Um, because the bingo boards, when they were made, we, we asked all teachers to contribute, whether you're an art teacher, music, PE. And so you do see some things that look a little crazy on the bingo board, like vacuuming your house. Well, that came from the PE teachers that, who said, I need to get up their heart rates. And it, oftentimes it's too cold to tell kids, go outside and play in the snow. Because so we, he was trying to come up with some other things of heart rate. That's important. Um, music, it's, it, it, so you'll see some music things on there, socially emotional. Um, so a, a, all teachers contributed to it. And as far as the consistency, I know Mark has worked with his high school staff um, because last year the comments were, we had kids who were way overwhelmed because there was a lot of work. So we've refined it. Mark's, Mark has worked with the staff to say, you know, staff, we need to work together to make it manageable, reasonable, and still a good e-learning day. So um, I know that has happened. So, yep, we're continuing to improve, and um, we got feedback from staff on the changes for next year. So, so we're working on it. And hopefully my comment on the bingo board didn't come across wrong. I saw it, and I, and I really liked it. My thought was that after, after four or five days, it, it gets old for the, the kids. Uh, the, the nice thing is I heard a lot of parents saying their kids were ready to be in school. They were tired of the snow days. <laughs> I would bet these two would mimic that, right? We had the opportunity to hear Gigi's comments a little bit from a student perspective at the work group, so I thought it would be good to see what Maggie, not to put you on the spot, but what you thought. Um, I guess what I would say is that, yeah, definitely last year there was a lot more work, and then this year I think some teachers have relaxed almost too much, and that's when, when they're not really utilizing it. I think is more when they get to the point where like they don't have enough enough student contact time like when they just give you like busy work and it's not really anything productive for the class that's when it gets to the point where that's like less effective as trying to make up school if it's just like read a book like yes I want to read a book but like it's not really helping you for the class and that's when it gets more difficult but I think that it is definitely a good alternative but only if it's utilized correctly I guess all about the calendar. That, uh, the e-learning uh, uh, situation, uh, I've got a lot of feedback on that too, and it, and it supports my contention that student contact time is extremely important because the, the, a frequent comment that I got from parents was that, uh, well, e-learning is fine, but it, it, it's a poor substitute for actual student contact with the teacher. Um, which, to my way of thinking, provides uh, an, an additional argument in favor of uh, having uh, as many student contact days <laughs> built into the calendar as we can. Are we experiencing any changes in learning gap? Does it um, increase learning gap for any of our students that we're aware of? Hard to tell you at this point. Um, and uh, I would say that... Um, yeah, I would say that this this number of um, days of uh, snow impacted or weather related uh, um, cancellation does impact um, instruction with students. It and, and it does, but you know the the you know when we did this a few years ago, we had, we had snow days built in and we added them on at the end of the year. And the pushback I received from that was. Okay, these days on at the end of the year are, are meaningless to kids. And so that's kind of where we're at with, with the whole um, um, e-learning piece of it. And, and again, I think it's incumbent upon us as, as a school district to provide as much value for that experience as we possibly can. And that's why we're, we're looking at ways we can do it better. The, the e-learning for the courses I taught would would work very well because the courses that I taught were pretty much online, sort of hybrid online courses anyway. Uh, assignments were available online, uh, reading assignments, uh, research assignments, the student could hand, hand in anything electronically. It worked fine for, you know, high school. 
I'm, I have no experience whatsoever in elementary grade, so I, I, you know, I can see where there might be some problems there because I, they're not probably going to be able to avail themselves of an online course to the extent that uh, the older students would. I don't but think it's something that we need to work on. I don't think anybody thought that e-learning would replace teaching. I, you know, I think uh, it's a good solution for the problem that we, we have in Minnesota. And I, I think that uh, I think the staff is evolving in their ability to, to provide meaningful instruction, and, but it will never replace teachers. So um, I still like it. I think it's a great program. And uh, we're going to need to get back to calendar. Um, that well, the post um, Labor Day calendar already has 174. The pre Labor Day calendar with 173. If we just is there, I mean, I, I guess teachers would have to come back after Memorial Day, but maybe they could come back, maybe they could be an option or something, what they want to come back that week. Um, but can we just add the 22nd as a student day? Is there something, I, I, think, I think the natural problem with that then, right after Memorial Day, after that long weekend, teachers are going to have to come back. Um, but if we added that um, day as a student day on the 22nd, and then teachers maybe could come back on Tuesday or maybe they could have an option coming back Tuesday or Wednesday in case they have an extended weekend or something. They could finish up, wrap up their rooms and everything. That would uh, fix the question and the problem with the number of student days and we'd still get that uh, um, PD in on the 21st of October. Two comments on that. The 22nd, if we turn that into a student day, the feedback I would have received from staff would be when are we supposed to do our end of the year room cleaning, grades, et cetera? And then the second part of that is typically the high school principal requires that the high school staff come to graduation. And so they give them, they let them leave early to come back for graduation. Um, if that were to be the case, um, we would have them teaching all day and then they wouldn't be able to come to graduation, or they could if they volunteered to come. But uh, um, th so that's that's kind of why that day is the way it is. I I when I was looking at the post Labor Day start, I think. From what the feedback that I got, that June eighth is going to be a is going to be a hard thing for teachers to see as well. I just think they're they're going that's going to be hard, and I think that's where the extra day comes is that Friday the fifth. If you look at the other calendar, that would be like the twenty second. So I think that's where we're picking up that extra day. Really, is at the end there. Um, I like to say, as far as the staff for student days. I think that a lot of the time you spend in the classroom can be used efficiently versus inefficiently. And I think that once the teachers are given more time to um, not only just collaborate between themselves and get things focused on the same subject like teachers who are all teaching history, but also new teachers and teachers who are stepping into new programs or classes that don't have curriculum that they need to make themselves. I think that it'd be really helpful, especially for those students, if there was a really um, good program that they would have in set, have made up and set. Because once you're in the classroom, um, like I said, a lot of time can be wasted. And if we could use it more efficiently, I think that would be more helpful and less stressful for the teachers and the students would get more out of it. And I know like, even when I'll, I'll go to a teacher, I'll, like, I'll say, I'll be gone the next day. Do you have anything planned? And a lot of times they'll be like, no, I haven't gotten that far. So I think it'd be nice if we could give the teachers more time. More time during uh, having more professional development days. 
It does. Uh, um, I guess I would agree with that just because I hear a lot of my teachers, they have to spend their own, like, free downtime, like, when they should be, like, home with their families or, like, doing personal work. Um, they're having to collaborate with other teachers outside of school because they don't have time during school, and that's when they have to plan all of their things to make sure that they all correlate and line up. But that just doesn't seem like it's really fair to them either to make them have to take their work to that extent, like taking it home. I guess that's just where I sit there. And it does make sense to me to have a time during the year to stop and look at some of the data that's coming in because then adjustments can be made to have a better outcome in the end. So that does make sense. Okay, we've had a lot of discussion. Is there uh, any direction? Or what are the wishes of the board? Could we maybe decide on one or the other calendar and then tease that out? I think that's a good idea. So is there a motion to adopt one of the calendars? I would move to adopt the calendar that starts in August. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the early calendar. And just for clarity, is that just to talk about the start date of it and then we'll talk about more of the calendar after one is approved or I, we're going to... I think that would be the smart okay. thing to do. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this vote would just be to vote for a starting date calendar and then work through the details of how many days of this or that after. Yeah. That would be appropriate. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the early calendar signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes five to two. Okay. Uh, then I guess that kind of narrows things down a little bit. Uh, any other comments on the calendar itself? I'm wondering if there are any other thoughts about snow days, about making up snow days or not. question is, is there any options on snow days if I, they need to be made up? I really don't see any way of um, efficiently or realistically scheduling days that, uh, student contact days that aren't already on the schedule. I mean, if, they, if you schedule them at the after the end of the, of the of the year, those uh, days would be wasted as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's just very difficult to to reschedule days that are lost. Um, there'd, there'd be so many problems with uh, you know other things that this, that uh, families ha had uh, planned and. It would just be a, a real bad situation. I think I would agree with that. I think uh, two or three years ago we ran into that situation and we were going to add a couple of days at the end of the year and it was a waste of time and uh, didn't really accomplish what we really wanted to. So I would agree with that comment. I would like to, I agree. I would like to have the e-learning days. Um, I do kind of like how it turned out this year, and it was just because it ended out that way that the kids did have one snow day that wasn't an e-learning day. You know, because with all of these, oh my gosh, it's been such a crazy winter, and then all the e-learning, 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 that was kind of nice. Hey, this is a snow day. <laughs> and uh, I think, I don't know if any, if you guys appreciated having one snow day, you know, actual real snow day, not e-learning. It was just kind of, an, especially because it was getting so monotonous. Um, I kind of like that, that I think if, if it turns out crazy next year or something, it'd be nice to have just like a snow day in the middle to, if it gets this crazy again. I don't think there's anything horrible with the kids having one just snow day, free fun day in the mix. 
um, to break up the monotony if something like this happens again. But I, I do like the e-learning, and I, like I said, I think it, it is growing and it keeps getting better, and I think it will continue to get better as time goes on. So. Yeah, I liken that too. When I was a child and we were scheduled to bale hay and it rained, I thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. But then when I got to be the guy in charge of baling hay, it didn't, wasn't such a good deal anymore because the hay still had to be baled and there are lessons that still need to be presented. So as a teacher, uh, I, I really, you know, if we had a, a, a day when that I was planning on doing something and then it rained, you know, or snowed, it just means that you got to do it some other time and it makes it a lot more difficult. It would be my preference to um, go ahead with the 173 student days and to have the district day on October 24, 21 for PD. My preference also would be to have January 2nd as a snow day. I agree with not adding them on to the end of the year, but I do think January 20th would be an option for a snow day. I'm so if we have one snow day next year, if, it, if we have one cancellation because of weather next day, then the 21st would be a student contact day then? Is that what you're saying? So I'm saying if there was a snow day prior to January 20th, then we could use January 20th for a snow day makeup, and then you would get have another student day back in there, and uh, also have the five e-learning days as options in addition to that. So my thought on that is just reflecting on this crazy winter we had. We probably, I mean, not probably, there, there's potential that we wouldn't be using, We, you know, there's potential that we wouldn't have a snow day yet, or we'd be potentially using e-learning. E my, my thought is use the e-learnings that we have in place, the five, and then if we, if we needed to use a snow day, um, that that would be when you add, but then I don't want to add because I think you're taking away from people's plans and things that they have done. So I'm, I, I feel like, um, I feel like, in my opinion, to not add a snow day, uh, a recovery snow day, is I, I just think it's for morale and for students. I just don't think it's a good idea. And I think if we have another winter like we just did, I think the board needs to look at a calendar then and say you know what, we can't keep doing seven e-learning, you know, days or eight e-learning days, you know, maybe. So that, that would be my input. I also think that uh, by January 20th, you don't know how many days you're going to have. I mean, we're looking at how many days we've had yeah. since then. And so I guess my recommendation, we stay with the calendar as is. How many snow days are we allowed before we have to make up? We have the five e-learnings. Since we've passed that, how many snow days are we allowed before we have to start adding on the calendar? So currently we are, help me out, Ashley, 173, 172? Okay, 73 secondary, 172 elementary this year. Um, we had the five e-learning days. So we're still at 173. On top of that, we've had a snow day and two more e-learning days, so we're at 170 um, and 169. The state minimum number of days of instruction is 165. So we still have some, some room to play with. Now we have districts just down the road from us who don't do any e-learning, who have been weather impacted as much as we have who go to school already into June, who will be going into school probably later into June as they're having to add days on. A lot of schools had, had President's Day at school yesterday that, that weren't necessarily planned for it. So that's kind of where we're at as a district. Yeah, we, we, the statute requires that we have 165 student contact days. We have 173, that's eight more, uh, plus we get five 
learning, uh, e-learning days, so that's 13. So we'd have to have 13 cancellations before we would be required to make up days. And this, this winter is challenging that so far. And it's not done yet. I'd move that we approve the early calendar as shown. Is there a second that motion? I'll second that. Any for further discussion? For clarity then, that would be on October 21st would be a district day. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Then we, we, uh, we need to adopt a calendar and then stick with it. Okay, we'll call the question then. All those in favor of adopting the early calendar as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you for uh, all the information and the input. And, uh, moving on then to 11.1, uh, .1, which is a resolution approving property tax abatement flurry. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Funk, uh, we have a resolution uh, for a property tax abatement. This is similar to what we've been bringing uh, forth many other times. Uh, this is in regarding to, you'll see in Exhibit A, um, this is for new construction. And uh, as it's been in the past, in the resolutions brought in the past, this is in regard to construction of a single family dwelling and uh, the tax abatement is for a period of five years. Okay, as mentioned, this is something that we've done in the past. Uh, the city and the county are doing the same thing. So, what are your wishes? Just one question, Larry, I've never read, and I don't think the city and county have any kind of a uh, prorated payback if the property is sold within five years, do they? I don't see it in here, but I've never noticed it anywhere either. Just thought maybe I'd missed it. We can check with Chad on that. The city's got the lead on this, and I will, I'll check with them. I move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the resolution to approve the tax abatement? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next we have an amendment to the 2018-19 budget. Lori? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Funk, I have the amended budget in front of you. Um, good news. Uh, based on the fall enrollment trended to year end and all the funding formulas that are in place, um, MDE did update the special ed aid calculation, for example. I was able to uh, utilize that for this um, amended bud budget brought to you. The good news is, if you can scroll, Ashley, to page five, um, the best news, really, uh, bottom line for this budget is that for the general fund and the unassigned category of the general fund, again, the general fund is where our main operations are, it is uh, basically a balanced budget. We have revenues uh, exceeding our expenses just slightly. Uh, it's a gain of 10,000. Uh, so virtually it is a, a balanced budget. Um, so we'd be anticipating the fund balance to be re basically remaining at that similar level of 6.2 million for the unassigned general fund. Um, otherwise, uh, some of the other categories um, of course, the construction fund reflects the sale of bonds and the proceeds from that for the construction project and the, the budget would, on the expense side for the construction fund, just reflects the estimated expenses through June 30th and of course the project would be completed then the next fiscal year. And that's why there is a fund balance at the end of the year for the construction fund. Um, otherwise, it's just a summary of where we anticipate where it'll be, and it's actually a very favorable budget. Any questions? Move to approve. OK. 
Okay, is there a second? Okay, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of um, the amendment to the 2018-19 budget signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. same sign. Motion carries. Uh, next, we have the parking lot bid results. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Funk, for your consideration would be approval of the Ulan Brothers. Uh, we received one bid for this particular project. Par parking lot improvements uh, would be for the, uh, the Southwest Middle School and Brookside Education Center is where the, the um, parking lot improvements would be um, realized at. And uh, we'd be recommending um, both uh, the sections one and two for board approval. Is this about what we anticipated would be uh, the area of the bids? Uh, this bid did come in a little bit higher than the higher than the estimate, and so Steve has already been working with the engineer to identify some change orders, some adjustments that we'll make in the specifications to reduce that cost. Are we, uh, Steve, this is more a question for you. Are we being very restrictive on some of our covenants on these bids? I heard a little bit from some local contractors on our stadium situation that maybe we are a little restrictive. And that's why I'm wondering why we're getting a low number of bids. And, and I don't want to get in the whole uh, hammer facility deal, but on this one in particular, when I noticed just the one bid. No, we're not being restrictive at all. Um, the biggest problem we have with parking lot with Eulen Brothers here, nobody else will come bid against them because they have to pay to travel. And once they get here, they have to buy mix from Eulen. So Eulen's going to have to, they really they don't even want to attempt to put in their time and money to do it for a bid because they just, the same thing happens with the city too. I mean, we're just kind of stuck with it. Um, and they did come in a little higher and higher than from what our engineers and architects you know, they, in Mankato, it would have been less. But now working with them, um, they have come down, and we've worked on some things that really aren't going to affect the project very much um, at all, um, and we'll still be within budget, though. And really, rebidding, we're not going to get anybody to bid again. We're, we are kind of stuck with so I mean, it's good that they're a local company, and we're doing with a local company, obviously, but we are kind of stuck with these guys. When they rework the bids then, um, we're not locked in at this price here then? Are we signing a contract that this is what we're going to pay, or if they come down in price, how is that going to work? How that works for the contract is the contract's writ written for this bid amount, and then we will uh, they will drop the the details of what's called the change order okay. and the change order will reduce the contract amount. Okay. That's what I was wanting, just making. So we'll be allowed to reduce them. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of uh, approving the parking lot bid signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, last item of business is a review, review of policy 714 or fund balance. Lori. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Funk, uh, we have an annu uh, annual review of our fund balance policy. It's stated there in the policy itself. It should be uh, reviewed annually. And uh, what I like to do, of course, is when, once I've brought the amended budget to the board uh, for their approval, that's the perfect time to examine the fund balance policy. And um, the, the policy currently states the district will strive to maintain a minimum uh, unassigned general fund balance of 14%, the annual budget. In that calculation, we exclude the long-term facility maintenance, LTFM, operating capital, and a category that's called TRAPRA, Special Funding Situation Pension Expense. And so uh, the budget that was approved tonight, the estimated fund balance for the unassigned general fund 
would, uh, even though we had like a break-even budget, will be around 13.5% uh, is what I'm projecting. To give you a flavor of where our fund balance has been over the last five years, uh, we've been very successful at hovering around that 14%. FY14, we were at 14.2. FY15, we were at 14 exactly. FY16, we were at 14 exactly. FY17, we were at 13.4. And FY18, we bumped up again very close uh, to 14% at 13.85. Um, so the, I just want to stress the, one of the importance, uh, important things about having um, a, a adequate fund balance, there's two, two different reasons. Um, there are, from time to time, uh, what can happen with the legislature if the state is having uh, a t tough uh, budget, state budget, what they can do is uh, change our aid proration where we have to wait another year to get the aid that we're, we should be getting in that current year. Uh, it's called uh, aid, aid proration or a shift. Uh, tax shift is another combination of that. Uh, how many years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, we experienced uh, aid uh, reallocation and a property tax shift. And what happened in those years was that even though we had, at that time, a 16% fund balance, um, we literally had to borrow $6 million just to cash flow for our payroll. And that's because we're not getting 100% of our state aid in the year we're earning it. Um, so that can happen from time to time, and that's why having a fund balance is important. Uh, because as you borrow money just to pay your bills, even though you have this, you know, what looks like a fun, healthy fund balance, that that interest cost is just eating away at your, your resources. Uh, so it is important to have a fund balance. Another Im important thing which we just realized is when you issue bonds, uh, whether it's a refunding, which we just did recently, or issuing a building bonds, that we, which we also did re recently, um, when we have the, the call with Moody's Investment Services, they look at all our financials. One uh, thing that they really look closely at is what is your fund balance um, percentage? And also, uh, you know, how is your enrollment trending? Are you growing or are you in decline? All those factors come in, but they specifically ask me, uh, about that fund balance, what I estimate it to be like in the middle of that year, um, I give him as much up-to-date information I can, and he told me it, it is very important to have that fund balance, and it does impact our rating, and that impacts what kind of t uh, rate is then when you issue the bonds, the interest rate. So it, it is a huge benefit to the taxpayers that we have a good fund balance, and it can save them an interest cost by having a favorable uh, uh, bond rating. So those are the factors that are important. I do believe I recommend to the board to keep this uh, fund balance policy as it is. It's good to strive for 14%. If we're just slightly less than that, uh, you know, at least we're striving for it. So it, it's still good to keep in place. I think Jill and I remember the days when we had to borrow money and it was not fun. And it really affected our our budget. We had more referendums. Um, so I, my personal feeling is this is an absolutely important policy that we, that we do have. So. Um, okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? The comment that I always say. So. I, I like that the word, I don't think I realized that this was in there before, but I like the word strive because I don't want us to be at the end of the year. And I understand a lot of our um, grants and everything are more secure, which is wonderful, but I don't want it to be that we're at the end of the year. We're not sure if we're going to get a grant. So we're like, oh my goodness, to keep this 14%, we have to cut where we might get this grant. We might find out in two months and then we can rehire. I would like to just so you know, at the end of the year, if we're, we're in this weird position, I'm going to say, you know, even if we can't quite meet that, or we're not sure, we're not sure at that time, I'd say let's not cut. Anyway, I just had to say that. I will say that every time. Thank you, Angie. We expected that. Yes. Well, I didn't want to be the old one. 
Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor of uh, keeping the policy 714 as is, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Meeting's adjourned.